Whereas Rob was doing sold out gigs um, of uh, show, which is a great show called Forget Me Not, uh, which was a whodunit saying an Alzheimer's word. So this gives me my slight link. Uh, the reason I know Rob, uh, no, not the reason I know him, I know the drinking woman, but <laughs> the way, uh, why Rob is here is because he's um, a nurse and has been a psychiatric nurse in the past. And I'll pass it over to Rob to introduce yourself. Hello, good people. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm Martin Rob. I'm uh, by trade I'm what they call a stand-up poet. If you've not heard of stand-up poet, it is niche. You know, it's uh, it's like stand-up comedy, but it rhymes and there's no jokes in it. And I do. And before COVID, I had the nicest job in the world. I'd go around the world performing my uh, weak poems to, to people. Um, before doing that, I was a man. I spent uh, 12 years as a registered mental nurse, uh, mental health nurse in. Uh, um, inpatient settings around mainly Leicester, Scotland and Australia. So I work mainly in what we now call adult mental health and psychiatric intensive care. Um, and uh, I, I went back to nursing when, when Covid happened. For, I, I've not done it for about a decade and went back. Uh, that was the first time in my life wearing a tunic. Uniforms have come back in nursing, which is not good. I, mean, I, I, I never wore a uniform in my whole career, but now I'm... I'm um, I have to say, a nursing tunic does not make me look more like a nurse, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it looks like I've nicked it. Um, uh, anyway, so I did that. Um, and then, as, uh, as an artist, I've, I've had quite a lot of involvement with the world of mental health. I've got three solo shows, uh, one of which, as Dave said, is, is a who done it set on an Alzheimer's ward. It's like um, Cluedo meets Memento, if that makes any sense. Um, and that show is now being used by several NHS trusts to train healthcare staff in ethics and raising concerns and in the wake of the Francis report and all this, which I could deviate from quite easily. So I'm also a patron of Leicestershire Action for Mental Health Project, um, LAMP, and they're basically the Leicester version of mine. I think that would be a lazy way of describing them, but that's them. And I'm their patron and I'm lead artist for an organisation called the Comedy Asylum, which is one of my favourite things ever. Um, it's basically me and a bunch of people, uh, the, the majority of whom have a label of quote unquote severe and enduring mental illness. And we put on sketch comedy shows and stuff like that. And you know, what's not to like? And we, uh, we also go into, and, and, and as far as I'm aware, I don't think anyone else in the country is doing this, we also go into inpatient mental health uh, settings and we lead, we lead comedy workshops and, co and workshops in improvising and creative writing and, and stuff like that and I love it to bits, it's great and, and, we, uh, and we do that all around the East Midlands really. So um, obviously when Dave had his episode, I visited, uh, it felt only fair uh, and, and of course because me and Dave have experience of both sides of the, of the psychiatric fence as it were, um, he's very kindly invited me along today to Pontificate. Um, if you're into it, can I give you a quick poem just before, just to give you a context of the thing? Um, it's a very short minute long. Um, true story based on my time as a nurse about 20 years ago, cautionary tale goes like this Dr. Bryce put her name in the wrong part of the form and inadvertently sectioned herself. <laughs> this amused us greatly because she was bad for people's mental health. She went on a trip to Venice, paid for by the drug company who were keen to invest in her impartiality. She changed everyone's meds when she came back. Carnage ensued and people relaxed. One man's mental health fell so badly to bits that he smashed up the ward and put two nurses on sick. So don't be like Dr. Bryce. Just stick to the guidelines from NICE. There you go, that's just a little offering from me to get into it. Cheers. Thanks. That round of applause did make it feel a little bit like an AA meeting. Thank you for it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yes. yeah. we're here. This is our first talk. I haven't really done things like this before, so we'll be discovering our way with you. But yeah, as Rob said, like, uh, have people seen the exhibition here, or are you going to see it? Yeah. 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 You're going to see it. So, um, I say towards the end of the exhibition that I feel feel like I've kind of bad mouthed the NHS a bit because the the, the, the tougher stuff, the harder stuff, sticks in your mind. And also, you know, we have, so I might, we're not gonna be disagreeing, but I might, it's, it's a little bit, you know, getting locked up for four months is a horrific thing to go through. So that's the side of, 
Although, uh, looking back, it was absolutely the right thing. So, anyway. Um, yeah, so we're going to be feeling out this talk together. And there'll be some things we disagree on, and there'll be some things we don't agree on. But I thought I'd just start by asking Rob, how did you first get into mental health? Oh, um, well for me, I got paid for going to sleep. It's really quite simple. Uh, I, I, was, I just turned 18, and I took a job working nights in this dodgy private psychiatric home. So, and by dodgy, I mean, there's me, 18 years old, no, no psychiatric experience, on my own all night, giving out meds. You know, no situation. Got paid in cash uh, in the morning, go about my day. Uh, and it's great, I loved it. Um, it never occurred to me it's dodgy. It wasn't quite a nice place. So it's like sleepover shit, so I had my own bedroom upstairs. So I was literally paid for going to sleep and I lived there all night. Um, and it was nice. This would be in uh, 1990 when the. Um, the, uh, they, they brought in what, they, what was loosely referred to as caring in the community. And so that meant that a lot of the old institutions were being closed and people were being discharged. Um, and so the, you know, the, 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 the people who, there were about 10 men who lived in this home, had all been in the local bin for about 30 or 40 years, uh, you know, a piece. And, and I was only 18, and looking back, they really took me under the wing. They were lovely. And, and, and it's quite a nice home in it, they weren't stingy, I remember that, so, and, and the, the cook was like Aunt Fatty from the famous fire, there was always like loads of trifle, I remember the doodles of trifle and spaghetti, so we'd stay up every night and watch movies and smoke cigarettes and eat trifle and uh, eat spaghetti on toast and talk about stuff and, and uh, yeah, then someone told me that was called nursing, and I thought, oh, I don't get qualified in this. <laughs> I thought, oh, no, I quite like this, I've been doing this for a living, you know, so, uh, so I did my nursing training at that point. Was it, was, there, it was very different to how it was, all spaghetti on the table Was yeah. there a moment when, you, when it suddenly, it sounds like a nice cushy job. It was, yeah, yeah. Was there a moment when it clicked and you, there's something like oh, that? Yeah, I, I think I just realised how much I used to look forward to going there. You know, that was all it was. You just, I, I remember thinking, I'll probably come in and socialise even if it wasn't getting paid for it. And uh, yeah, I remember the, uh, the, the first person that had a profound effect on me was in that home. He'd come from a family of very reputable accountants who'd ostracised him when he had his first psychiatric breakdown as a teenager. And he, he spent decades in a local institution. And he was in his late 50s by the time I met him. But you could tell within minutes he was intelligent, really sharp, witty kind of fellow. But, um, but he was telling me when he was in his very early 20s, you know, he'd been resident in the, in the local hospital for a few years, and in his 21st birthday he decided to go home and surprise his mum. So he got, uh, he got permission to go home and surprise his mum, and be a very wealthy family. His mum saw him from, you know, the right end of the driveway, called the old Bill. You know, he didn't even get to his front door, you know, he'd been completely out of by his family. And, and uh, I never think really angry about that. And, uh, I'm pleased to report that anger's never really left me. You know, it's, it's sort of guided it all with the, uh, the idea that someone should be ostracised because of uh, that's some sort of condition. To see. Yeah, I mean, I was there, I was there uh, for the second half of my stay inside. Um, and I was lucky enough, I had like a load of friends. I had one friend who made a Facebook page for other friends called Day Watch. So I had my parents come out and see me most days, um, you'll read all about them in there, and then I have my friends who came to them in the evening. But a lot of the men, like, didn't get any visitors. I mean, is that is that something? That yeah. Know? Well, I think on we know that um, social isolation increases the risk of relapse and increases the risk of readmission. So, and, and yeah, that's. It's sort of a no-brainer often it would be the patients that have got a robust level of support, whether it's from friends or family that would generally speak have a better prognosis. You know, so yeah, it's all it's all, it's all connected, I think. That um, it's yeah, I suppose when you when you're in a crisis like that you do find out who's got your back, don't you? Yeah. It's a week from the chat into the yeah. debate. Yeah. I was quite lucky because they say they say I'm always on this find out who your real friends are. But actually, my friends, my real friends, turned out to just be my friends. So that was nice. Um, uh, bonds with patients. 
Yeah. And I can not talk about it. This is the guy, I had a great father, but I'm like, you really... The thing that I always, I, that I was left with was, and this is also when I was in the hospital for uh, brain injury, people you really, the people you really meet aren't, I mean, who, um, you know, aren't the doctors necessarily who diagnose you, but I've always felt that it's the nurses. It's the, they're the people who can tell you how many cups, of, how many sugars you have in your tea. Anyway, so there was this, um, this very big nurse who was quite, he was quite stern. And when we started off, I, I hated him or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, because it was so stern and kind of I reacted to that. And of course I was flying, so I was throwing all kinds of insults at him. But um, as we got to know each other, we kind of, that fell away. And then towards the end, he used to take me on escorted walks where a nurse takes you out of the ground. And we'd go out, out to the grounds, to the next road or whatever, where he was, it was okay for him to have a cigarette. And I'd have a cigarette and he'd have a cigarette. So, yeah, Bond, is there, is there like a, a, a patient that really sticks out to you? Uh, yeah, well, I suppose I was so, um you, you report with, as a nurse, you report with your patient is the ABC of why you're there. And I don't know how much of, I suppose every generation of mental health nurses thinks that there's just a golden age. I'm no exception because when uh, I go on to uh, the unit as an artist these days, it's quite common to see that qualified nurses in the office and that the care is provided quite often by unqualified agency nurses. Um, but the way I always felt was that getting to know your patient was the big, what was the build and end of why you're there. Like I say, we are the only profession that sees our patients 24-7, you know, so, and, and I think, yeah, so you, you're prior to, you, but you really want the, the hospital you work at to be a place that people run to, not from, where I feel, and of course, the challenges are there when you're nursing people who, A, don't think that they need to be there, B, don't think that there's anything wrong with them, C, might be paranoid and terrified and aggressive or whatever, so, uh, and might think that you're a part of that. Um, and so you know, sort of the, the challenge of sort of behaviour, if you like, is that um, I think when when you are on in these circumstances, where you're on a section, or if you have a paranoid illness, or, or, or whatever, you know, it, it all becomes very punitive. You know, you get your freedom taken away, you get your car keys taken away, your house keys, you get you probably get your phone taken away, you can't watch any social media, you. Uh, you're probably medicated against you will, you might end up in seclusion, you might, you know, there's all these things. Um, and so I also the, the knack as a, of a nurse is to do all, you, you do all these very really punitive, restrictive things to people, but you do it in a way that does, that does not compromise the, the trust and report. And that's tricky. <laughs> yeah, that's, right, 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 that's really tricky. Um, but there are ways of doing it. And I, I discovered quite quickly that if I was honest with people, and firm about what I was doing and why. But even if I was doing interventions that people weren't necessarily thanking me for, um, I'd always give them a chance to ventilate to me afterwards and call me a, or, you know, whatever kind of name they wanted to do so. But I'd find as long as I was up front and straight, I didn't fanny about what I was doing. Uh, in the longer term, people trusted you. So when, when people were out patient and they ran the ward, it would be you that they asked to speak to if they were in some sort of trouble. But at the time that they were poor, it would be you that would be the, the, the enemy. You, yeah. you know? So I think um, it, it is difficult because I think a lot of what you do is relies on presumption. You you presume to know that the normal that that is for that person that you try and return it to and things like that. And, and, it's, and it's tricky. But I think as far as you can, you try and you, you know, you, um, is there, is, there, is there a particular patient that stands out to you? Oh, there's thousands. <laughs> they all got done and they'll be all, you know. But, uh, well, not all of them, but yeah, the, 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 um, I suppose you always remember your characters, really, don't you? Or the people that gave you a run for your money, you know. Mm. Or, um, yeah, just... Um, a lot of people, I, I, I think the ones I remember is one of the ones that did kind things for other patients as well. Mm. Uh, you know, there's, there are people that you care with. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, want, you want to get to specifics of, uh, 
particular. I don't know, there's, um, I suppose the one patient I ever saw, I mean, yeah, um, he was, there was one particular man who chased a psychiatrist off the wall. I was, you know, I was very, he was like a very small version of Eric Walker. And um, he also had a bipolar condition as well. He was, uh, and, but really witty as well. And, uh, and just, just, yeah, I, I don't know. You, you, People are people, aren't they? People are interesting, so you always meet people that you click with. Um, so, it's yeah. interesting you mentioned bipolar there, and you mentioned sectioning earlier, people yeah. there who feel that they, I mean, that's the thing about, if you, if you get sectioned on a bike, that's why you end up getting sectioned on a bike. Well, I, I, it's, it's very rare that you there's someone informally, as if, if someone has bipolar illness and they're high, I mean, it's not very easy to stay in school. Yeah, because people, people say to you, yeah. or they take you there or whatever, and, and, and the doctors and the nurses say, we think, you know, you might want an informal stay or a voluntary stay. You go, what? I'm fucking fine, mate. I'm, I'm firing on all cylinders. I don't know what you're talking about. Because, I mean, I don't know how this is. Like, I've only had one bite by the manic episode. I mean, so there is a misconception about bipolar. A lot of people think uh, it's the kind of tricyclical, where I think if I'm getting my terms right here, Rob, which is this idea, the idea of bipolar is being really up one week, and baking loads of cake or whatever, and then really down the next week. And that's not how it's worked for me. I've had maybe about four or five episodes in my life which have always been, I don't know, four years, but well, one time there was only one year in the middle, but they've been fairly spread out. So, um, so yeah, I experienced this bipolar high and my mum and dad tricked me into going, but, you know, uh, was, you'll read on the boards, but they, they said, oh, let's take you home and they got me in a cab and took me. To the, to the to the mental health unit and at the time you're like I was writing I was creating you're like I'm fine but of course I it's was, a, it, it is the oldest porky in the uh, in the psychiatric book is it, is it, you just need to come into hospital for a few days you've got to fall for that one yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I'm, but that's probably you know that is definitely why the section they said do you want to come in voluntarily? And I'm no, I'm fine. I'm great. What are you talking about? I'm having the time of my life. Um, yeah. So, um, so by so I was by bipolar, and um, you worked with bipolar patients. Yes. Yeah. Um, this this is something that I haven't really touched on in the exhibition, um, but. When you were inside, as I call it, um, I certainly came, and it wasn't just the bipolar, but I certainly came across the idea of faith a lot more. Because, um, I mean, for me personally, I just, I, I was a lot higher, I just felt like things were connected, the idea of God didn't seem so ridiculous to me. And um, looking back, I've, uh, I, I kind of thought, oh no, when I was in there, I thought, I wonder if Jesus was bipolar. And that's something you, you've said me. We, we conversed about that in the car, it was a very short conversation. Yeah. You said, I wonder if that, and I went, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, I don't know, I can't quite sum up what I mean. Um, the thing about bipolar is it, it really hides things. And as you, you said in the car, it improves your IQ. And um, I'm not sure where this question is going, Rob. Um, I mean, have you, have you, let's go back to faith and bipolar yeah. and schizophrenia. I mean, do you see, have you seen that a lot? Well, yeah, I suppose um, pretty much every mental health condition I can think of is an element of faith. Because I suppose every mental illness really can think about it. Fear is somewhere there. 
in the heart. So whether you're talking about a psychotic condition or an eating disorder or de depression, certain anxiety, well, you know, the, the fear will be somewhere. And so where, where there's fear, there's faith, isn't there? You'll always find. Um, but there's always been, I mean, you're talking to the bloke who twice in his career has had to escort to a Catholic priest off the ward for trying to perform an exorcism before. You know, so again, it's not twice. Really, it's, yeah, twice in two different, no, not on the same day, that would be a bit, but uh, yeah, on two different occasions. Over the so, what was the course of course, trying to have a go at uh, exercise in a deep room for a moment. So, how did that solve one was, of my patients? Was there family involved? And they said, um, well, one person was um, um, a, a sort of long term psychotic condition. It was generally well managed, but um, her main social outlet was her church who would say, if you don't take your medication because if you're a proper Christian you won't be in it, kind of, which wasn't helpful. Um, uh, I know one had quite a tricky family. Mm. So, so yeah, faith does happen a bit, but I think when, um, um, and, and it's the cliche isn't it, for people that are high in a bipolar context and thinking Jesus is a God or a deity or whatever, the, 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 those sort of delusions of grandeur are very common I suppose. Um, but I think with other conditions, faith is a big part of it as well. You know, it's quite, you know, if you have a, a paranoid condition, there's no reason that that wouldn't have a religious connotation somewhere around it as well. I mean, this is, I guess, what I was vaguely trying to look at. I guess um, the atheist in me, so I'm just proffering this, this is not what I, the atheist in me, me would say, because um, there are, there are definitely the three in me. Would say the atheist in me would say it's just a mental illness. You're all going through this high, and then you're going to go down. This is the mental illness. The agnostic in me would go. Mm, well, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not yeah. sure because I am I'm mainly agnostic. And the person in me, in me who believes in, in maybe something, who maybe believes in something, still the agnostic part really, might say that uh, when we're high. Maybe we just, I mean, we call it... Back, More in touch with the... Yeah, uh, the, in touch uh, with the divine. And the, I suppose the difficulty is, isn't it, that when, when you're sort of 11 or 12 high, that's where you're full of beats, high IQ, full of confidence, slightly socially disinhibited, you know, disinhibited already. But then when you get sort of 15, 16, 17 high, and, it, and, and that's the point where, sort of, where people are more likely to be aggressive. Mm. You know, or clothes might start coming off, or they're more likely to be sexually inappropriate as well. Mm. And that, I think that would be harder to argue that that level of high was the... Yeah. So, and, 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 you know, as, as we've discussed, quite a lot of people who've had a long term bipolar condition, but at some point, you know, everyone likes that sweet spot of 11 out of 10. It's so good. It's such a nice feeling, yeah. So it's quite common for people to try and diddle around in their necks to keep it on that. 11 out of 10 sweet spot, but the difficulty is that when you're 11 or 12 out of 10, it's, it's very hard to think you don't need medication. Yeah, it's all right. Just read that. That's yeah. it. It's carrying on taking it. So. I mean, you talk yeah. about sexual inappropriateness, I mean, I'm mentioning that, mm -hmm. you know, I said, some, I said some things to some nurses which I'm not very proud about. Because you read those through them yeah, as yeah. well. And again, that's one of the things as a, as a nurse is to reassure people when they do come down. When, when people become be thinking again, when they've heard, people are mortified about the things that they've said and done. You know, so again, one of you, one of the tasks is to give people that reassurance. Because that... it is a tricky combination. Because not only are you the most charming, debonair person you've ever conceived, you know, you know that you've ever been. You're also the randiest as well. <laughs> so it's a bad, a bad combination. Um, <laughs> I was going to say something, you said something, and I, I made a note that I was going to question you about that, but I can't well, remember. Well, well, I remember, it. I did want to chase a naked man through the maternity ward of Lester Jones. Nice. Who, was, who again was quite disinhibited. Um, I remember the thing I was going oh, right, to say. Oh, right, I'll jog it. It is actually, so, as I said, it was my, my, my first bipolar eye, and it's not really dealt with in the exhibition deals with the um, with the section. So I'll just talk about it briefly. So um, I was working on 
a stage musical of my children's book, The Nose and Name We Picked, which is available downstairs to buy. And, um, and I thought, uh, so, you know, I said to a taxi driver, um, you know, I said, how are you doing? I said, fine, I'm writing a children's book and it's an agnostic parable that's going to change the world. So I was on that, I was writing the music as well, and it was, it was great, but at the same time, I was putting myself in really uh, tricky positions. Like, both two of these flashpoints involved involve the homeless, which became a kind of obsession with me. Um, one was where these lads on the night out were horrible to this homeless person, and I'm, I'm five foot five, but for some reason, I, I felt like I could stand up to that, and you know, I narrowly avoided the beating. And the other time was um, there was this homeless guy, and he was he had a guitar, and he was trying, and he, and he was getting nothing. So I said, "It's okay. Well, I'll, I'll help you out." So I stopped people and recited them. I'm also a poet, but not as good. Recited them little poems, and I, and I got a like. 40 quid for this guy. Then I said, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, should I go and get this to Chinese? And I went off and I left him with my coat and my laptop. And of course, now um, I feel bad. A nice way of looking at it, I feel bad about, the, you know, giving him the opportunity. So, when someone, if you're homeless and someone does that, anyway. But well, my point being, so this was all happening, stuff like this was happening, and no, no one really had a clue what was going on because it was my first time. But Rob, you were the first person to kind of go, oh, because didn't yeah. really meet I wonder if this could be Because we met in a pub, didn't we? Yeah. And my parents were there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you were just more like yourself than normal. I don't think I've been able to describe the London out of ten. really, really like yourself at the end. Um, but to the point of being quite irritable, which is not like you, no. you know. Um, so again, I'm going to go, keep bringing it back to the challenge of nursing fees with different conditions. Because mm -hmm. I know you, we've known each other for years. Yeah. Uh, you've, we've, you've been on a, you know, we've done fringe festivals together with a lot of the same people, all the rest of it. When I saw you presenting in a way that to me was obviously um, elevated and food, um, and not, in a, not in a happy way, uh, you know, felt more happy for you as well. Uh, and it was because I know you and I thought, right, well, I think that, that looks like he's a bit early. Yeah. Um, the difficulty is, of course, when as a nurse you meet people usually when the crisis is peaked. So at the point that you meet them, they're already in whatever state they might be in at the point that they get spat through your door. Um, and that's very tricky, I think, because we all have our different individual normalities, don't we? And so it's, it's very difficult for the services to then assume what would be normal for you. Because you're, you, are, you are normally quite a gregarious person. Um, it's not unknown for you to say things that are socially inappropriate <laughs> because that's you, right? But that's that's who you are. So again, when so that gets complicated if you go into a bipolar sort of, you know, your mood becomes elevated, and then you say things that are socially inappropriate. Is that is that you being you, or is that your? And, and that is the tricky one, isn't it? And, I mean, I, Rob's talked about when that irritability, and you know, I, I when I mentioned. Um, my parents tricked me into taking me to the. We had a big argument. It's a long story. You can read about it. It's just out there. Um, but I ended up having a scuffle on the floor with my dad. You know, my dad is the most harmless, lovable, you know, um, gentleman. If you want to meet my mum. Well, so are you, Dave. So it wasn't uh, much of a scuffle, you know. Yeah, no, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's old as well. He's less blah than me, you know. Um, just a little note, there is another talk happening where you can meet my mum if you want. So I'm going to be talking to Pete Shenton, who's an artist, a Rob and a friend, and um, my mum, we're going to be talking about support networks and looking after someone who's got an intersection. But I don't know the date, 
because that's how I am my mind about it. Um, <laughs> yes, we are on the website. Um, yeah, I wonder if there's, there's, three, there's three topics which we've talked about, which I feel quite strongly about, um, um, about how what I think is a little bit wrong with the NHS, and they are uh, seclusion, smoking, and wanking. Um, Not all at the same time. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just a moment. Um, it's the smoking that would be the problem with seclusion, isn't it? Because you'd have to get a cigarette back here and that. And that would be tricky. Light it. Yeah. Um, they, in fact, we didn't want to seclude the patient. You need a cigarette lighter internally oh. and set fire to a night attire and then everything. Most of the things in seclusion are anti flammable, is it? But yeah. it's still much to set fire to the pyjamas in the seclusion room. Really. So, we'll start with seclusion. Okay. So, uh, what, it, what there is, is this in the room there, in the exhibition, there's um. So, when I was put in seclusion, I decided it was it wasn't for me and I really didn't like it's just a white room basically. And when I was inside I had a little doggy notebook with me and I drew up plans of what I think seclusion should be. And then uh, the nice thing about this was when I got offered to do something in a in a in a, in a um, exhibition in a gallery, I thought I'll make my actual seclusion room. So there's a room in there which is just, it's got nice murals, grass on the floor, which I know you come to, <laughs> and um, nature sounds, and, um, and some books and play day. My theory being you can't top yourself with play day, although I might disagree with that as well. So that is, that's the angle I'm coming. Um, well, well, yeah, me, me and Dave don't agree on seclusion. That's <laughs> I, think, I think we do agree. Since we talked about, it, I think we do actually agree. Because I, I think where we would disagree is that I, many, you know, seclusion is one of those things that is unpleasant um, and shouldn't be there. But unfortunately, we need it. And I've worked in hospitals that don't have seclusion rooms, where you inevitably see increased use of medication, physical restraint, chemical cough. Um, so, like many things, I think seclusion has a place, but it needs to be a last resort, it needs to be used properly. Um, uh, but where, where, and, and I think, and I always felt that because of the nature of people that go in there, by which it's usually about heading off some kind of aggression at the past, and particularly if people have um, non mood elevated psychotic experience, like if they've got uh, ideas of reference, for example, where you you, you, you believe that any kind of stimuli is a message to you and you alone with an instruction. Um, I do believe that a seclusion room needs to be a no stimulus environment with glamours and all the rest of it. And, 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 oh, okay, I won't okay. mention the pulling on the astro turf because that's okay. a for people. Um, that, yeah. See, well, the, 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 the thing I would say is um, for me, when I'm like really going through something, like, um, so maybe I'm not that kind of, I haven't been that kind of psychotic where things were to, so for me, when I'm going through something very heavy, I definitely do need distraction. That is the only, that's... Well that's where I think we would agree, yeah. Because yeah. what, what it sounds like you've designed and what it's all pointing to, and I think there's a really valid argument that you're making here, is for um, almost like a relaxation room, like a low stimulation room. Like uh, you know, a room where you can actually unwind, where you feel your agitation range, whatever it is, spiraling or escalating. A room where you can actually go, and there might be soft music, and it might be soft on the floor, and there might be reading matter or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, an argument that wards like the one you were on should have a different room, which does enable people to relax and take a bit, like a time out area, yeah. where they can actually go and know when they're staff to be talked down. Or whatever. So actually, if you got, if you have rooms like that and they are well designed and they're well used, then the need for seclusion lessens. Uh, but talk to me. I think I think the seclusion is such a, a, a dangerous, unfortunate, necessary, specific thing. I think when we do use seclusion rooms, I think it should basically.
the end. Um, I mean, I can see, absolutely see, someone being so aggressive and overstimulated that they need just nothing. I guess, I mean, I suppose, but you can go back to your point. I guess it's in, in the NHS and psychiatry at the moment, or at least in 2015, there's very much one size fits all. Yeah. So, but I was chucked in for being a little bit aggressive. It's a long story. Mm -hmm. Yes. This, this I'm, I'm sure I would not have done that today. Absolutely sure. But the thing that actually got me was there was a nurse, and he seemed to be getting a little bit of a kick out, and he said, So I did shout my head off for half an hour. Um, and then I said, okay, I'm ready to calm down now, whatever. And I said, well, can I have a book or something? And he said, no, you can't. Like, you would have done that differently. I'd, I'd, I'd risk assassination, so it depends on the person. By the way, people have books in seclusion before now. But it's like I say, it would it'd be an exception on the rule. But it's, it is tricky. And I, yeah, and I've seen bad practice. You know, I've, I've seen some, you know, weird. There's a lot of things in psychiatry that can be done badly when they do when they are done badly, they, you know, enormously damaging for people. Um, for me, everything I say, the ABC is keeping that rapport with the patients. If I do seclude the patient, like it's still a present tense, but you know, back in the day, if I did seclude the patient, there would no why I was doing it. I would make the decision. So you hear a lot of the doctors say this needs to happen, we do it. So I tend to own the decision I've made. I'll explain what I'm doing, I'll explain everything that we're doing. So if they are receiving medication as part of the process, they'll know what it is and why they're having it. You'd keep the seclusion going for as, as little time as you possibly could. And then as soon as it was over, you'd have a debrief with the patient where they could sit down and ventilate that out, maybe feel that you could maybe hatch a bit of a plan together to head off the pass for next time. So that that would be a way of doing it well. Which which doesn't mean it's it's ever going to be a nice process for people um, and sometimes we we use seclusion not because it's good for the patient but because what well, when I was practicing was busy 30 bed wards you know it's good for the other 29 patients yeah, yeah. yeah. see yeah. that's a well that's a but I'm, I'm aware of the time slightly but so we're going to crack on a little bit let's briefly deal with smoking okay um so I this okay so in 2015 when I went inside um you can smoke. Um, and for me, it's a huge like bonding thing, and you've said this. Um, so the key was, um, I went into a ward, and I was ward bound. You get, they, they make you ward bound for about two weeks in the session, and so you can go on walks. But the, the difference is, uh, inside the ward, now, this, by the way, this makes me sound like I'm holding Bob responsible for everything. <laughs> it's a yeah. it's a, um, uh, there was a little area and you could smoke in. And um, I, uh, so, so that means for two weeks, I wouldn't have been able to smoke in that little area and I had to go outside, which would have been horrible. Actually, I wanted to bring this up more with Philip Ross than you, because he designs yeah, but anyway, I'm oh, sorry, we've well. begun. Um, so, I mean, you probably agree with me, or not. I, I, well, with the smoking thing, I'm one of those annoying idiots who agrees with everyone. <laughs> you know, I can see all, all points of view about it. So basically, um, when I was practicing, um, cigarettes were a currency of, of mental health, very much. It's, you know, very much, put the social worker down, I've got a cigarette, you know. <laughs> it would work. Um, and, what I loved about it was that the patient smoke room would always be the epicenter of the, sub of the subculture. It was the only room on the ward where the patients were more powerful than the, the staff. And it was like, you, you go on duty, you, you go to handover, and then you go to the patient smoke room and get a proper handover. Because uh, that was where everything went, went down. And it was just a really nice way of just, again, it all comes back to get to know your patients. For me, it was a really great way of getting to know your patients as equal human beings, where they, you weren't there to assess the mental state. They weren't on the guard. You'd find out what kind of music they liked, what kind of, what, what floated the boat, what made, and it, and it had a sort of den of iniquity vibe to it, because it sort of, the, the fan would always be broken. This is whether it's in Scotland or Australia, wherever, the fan is always broken. 
whatever colour they've painted the wall, it's always yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, a lot of unknown non smokers don't go in there. So, so that was great. And when they got rid of smoking, obviously that went. And I did feel that if, you know, NHS Trust do like to say that they're listening to their service users or the people on the receiving end of their service. If they did, they wouldn't have done the smoking back because it was so utterly unpopular, just anecdotally, just, you know. I mean, the that one, said. The one thing I would say <laughs> I just, yeah. is that, like, you know, so mental health, there's a big connection between mental health and smoking. And, um, and so you put someone on a ward in the worst moment of their life and you say, uh, oh, by the way, you can't smoke. Okay, see you later. And, but yeah. Yeah, and, and there's certainly avoidable restraints that occurred when the smoking ban, particularly when it was brought in, as you can imagine, it was actually just. Yeah, so, so, that, so yeah, you're right. That, that said, we're undeniably healthy for it. You know, I, you know, I tried so often to give up smoking. As soon as I left nursing, straight away. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, for me, it was weird, though, because I was vaping. But they, I mean, this is back in 2015, but they had an issue with vaping and charging it. So I ended up smoking, going back to smoking and smoking more. Um, I, I brought it up. Um, I don't know where we're going to go with it. Shall we deal with wanking? <laughs> okay, so there's a board in there called wanking. And uh, I'm very proud of that board. Uh, it fills me with joy. That you know, I can be in a proper museum. I've been in the in at the Attenborough Centre, where you know they've had Picasso and one and other people. And I've put a board up there called Wanking. And basically, Wanking, I would say, I think this is maybe particularly tricky for men because yeah, your bits have to anyway. You're checked up. You're checked up on by a nurse every 15 minutes. And um, so that's the first problem. Um, second, all your digital medias, they take your phone and your laptop. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, there's, there's, so there's no visual stimulation. So um, you end up kind of fantasizing about the nurses, which is not a good well, thing. Well, if I'm a nurse, you've got to be a quick search I don't know, Rob, but we didn't talk about this. We didn't talk about this. I mean, but I, no, <laughs> I might try and raise this with Philip Ross, who does design and tell me. Right, okay. So there's a continuum, isn't it? In adult mental health, there's a continuum between safety and privacy, right? You can't have both. And that, that's always been a problem. Whenever a unit is designed or redesigned, we try and meet the needs of privacy and the need of safety. And they are, um, uh, they, they are sort of mutually contradictory in a way. But if you want to keep people totally safe, you don't want a big night in gale or water, everyone's bent in a row, you just look at what you do all day, right? But no harm will come to anyone. You know, we had to, as you remember, we had a spate of um, um, suicides on the, the uh, local unit, close to us, which were very well publicised. And as a knee jerk, the NHS Trust removed doors from all the toilets, you know, because mm -hmm. obviously no, nothing bad for yourself as people, people watching have a dog. Um, and that's where it goes way too far for safety at the expense of privacy. At the same time, we know that when people have privacy, actually that's actually better for them emotionally as well, for reasons that don't need an awful lot of going into. So there is that balance, and, and, it, and it's changed over since I've been practicing. So when most of my career, I was on a busy, you know, 30 bed ward with five, five bed dormitories and then five side rooms. So the side rooms are going for the people that are really quite, quite poorly. Mm -hmm. And everyone else is in five bed dormitories. So you can imagine that's actually no, no privacy whatsoever. We've got these bed curtains around you. And at least these days in most, most mental health units, certainly adult ones, people are more likely to have their own room. Or there's some that you might get two people. You know. Yeah, well, 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 sorry, I'm just curious actually. This is, um, when I was in there, we had bays. So yeah. you'd have six beds. Yeah. All in all. Do they still exist? Or I, I don't know, because again, I go on 
an artist sort of don't, I go in as an artist sort of don't let me go near the dormitory sort of sleeping arrangements now because uh, I don't see the communal areas now. But I know that I know that the number of I know the privacy thing has improved. Um, and then in terms of the 15 minute ops, there's all sorts of ways. Because I was working in eating disorders over the course of the pandemic. Um, so, so you have a lot of you, you know, people that are different gender to me, a lot younger to me, and I'm very aware of their vulnerabilities, you know. And so, and a lot of them we have to check every 10 or 15 minutes. And so, th there are certain things you can do to enter an arrangement with a patient where you can protect their privacy and safety at the same time. So, for example, if you ask yourself why is that person on 15 minute observations, or in your case, it's probably more likely uh, an AWOL risk rather than a self-harm risk. Yeah, so, if so. that's the case, if you go, right, I'm going to have a long bath, Rob, can you not check me? But, so, it means that when I knock you, I'm just knocking you, do you all right there, Dave? And you go, yeah, I'm all right, that's all. And that way, then you've not let you. No, I you, 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 I you know, so, so, so that So, that means both parties happy. It gets more tricky when, when people are at risk of suicide and deliberate self-harm because if you do make a mistake, it could put someone's life at risk, and that, and that is where it does get quite tricky. Because people no, can no, say no. all sorts of things in a, in a not I mean, check while they're still, you know. If you're suicidal, though, you're less. I mean, this is just my experience. You're less likely to be white. <laughs> yeah. I've never had a good suicidal one, I have to say. No, um, yeah, no. Um, yeah. I don't know why, but that surprises me. <laughs> um, uh, right, right, we've dealt with wanking, okay. By the way, it's, a, yeah, it's one of the boards, but just to give you a little bit of the, 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 the end of the story, the thing was, so I was being let out to visit my house and stuff with my parents, and I said to my parents, yeah, I'm just going to get some cigarettes. And I thought I'd go very 80s and 70s and buy myself an art pamphlet, you know, a magazine. And um, I was too short. <laughs> I'm still! <laughs> yes, I couldn't reach. And I had to ask the lady behind the counter to, who was taller than me, it was, it was devastating. <laughs> um, uh, right, well, I think that. Is that yeah, yeah do you know, um, is that okay, or do you want to we can talk a little more, or...? We, we don't know what you're expecting, but... Does, are there any questions? I was wondering about medication, about what, how they, you know, while you were there, they'd been working out, hopefully, an ideal form of medication for you. So how long did that take? Well, that was, for me, I'm sure Rob can talk about this as well, but that was tricky for me for a while, because for a while I wouldn't take it. You know, um, all, I, all I remember is they did try me on various things. So I was on Respiridone for a while, which I, I liked it, gave me lovely dreams. Um, but the event, I, I eventually got put back on Quetiapin. Um So yeah, that, they kind of, they did uh, experiment a bit with me and, and tried me on that for two weeks and that for two weeks. I mean, for me, like, looking back, and uh, as I say, in the, the thing, I, I do bad mouth a bit, but it was, being sexual was actually essential for me because I got, I got reviewed, even though it's the nurses here, you know, you know, I got reviewed by doctors, it was, that was their speciality, rather than some overworked GP. I have a clue. Um, so what is your experience with medicating? Um, well, I, I, it's tricky in mental health because there's so much trial and error because different things affect different people. So if you look at something like Prozac and Fluoxetine, there are some people who say, I was giving him my life back and other people for whom it's like, you know, and, and both of them tried it and had very different results. And, and I suppose the thing is, we, we know we, we know that certain meds do certain things. So um, you mentioned respiridone. So that, that, that's that's known for being. So people who have like long-term schizophrenic conditions, that can be really good for people who have negative symptoms of schizophrenia, by which I mean the lethargy and lack of motivation can be really good for that. So there's some things that we know are more likely to affect certain things in certain ways, but it's always trial and error because you don't know until you're on it, and that's the tricky thing. And then. Quite a lot of antidepressants, you're looking at least three weeks 
to see any kind of beneficial effect or change. So that's, that, and, and, if, and if people are tormented, that's an awful long time for people to go through torment for a light in the, the end of the tunnel that might not be there. For, you know, it might get, we get to three, four, five, six weeks and up. That antidepressant's it's not quite doing it. We need to switch it again, then it's another. And that, and that happens quite a lot with people. So the, there is a lot of trial and error based on it. And, and some, so it's, it's quite commonplace for people that are admitted purely to change their meds around, you know, because obviously you want to take people off some meds before trying to want a new one. So that, that can be quite a dangerous time for people. So sometimes people could be admitted for that purpose and then, yeah. So I was taken, I was on, I was on uh, antidepressants to tell I was taken off it and put on uh, Corsarpin and then when I did crash I said, I said, I remember saying to my nurse, I'm really, after, I'm depressed now, I think I need uh, antidepressant, antidepressant and they said, well we can't give you that because it might trigger another bipolar manic episode and I was like, that's fine. I'll have another one of them, please, rather than this. But, yeah, it'll be good. Um, yeah, so is that we're Just also, by the way, I know it's a lot of, I'm doing a lot of my own plugging here, but I know inside there's a, it's quite a small space, but so there's a lot of text to read. If you don't have time, there's always, you can buy the book version downstairs. Plug, um, but it's got other stuff in it. So it's actually got my doctor's notes. Oh, let's very quickly talk about doctor's notes, nurses' notes. Okay. So this was when I came out to writing the boards and everything. I went back to my doctor's notes and my nurses' notes because it's all in there. If someone is watching you all the time, um, and there was one moment. There was this young Chinese trainee doctor, and she. Because she was training, she would have to get me to strip down. I do mention this here and take my temperature and things. You're looking a little bit of gas in there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, she, well, I just remember her nurses' notes. So intimacy doesn't happen in there really. I remember finding these quite kind of exciting. I'm not saying anything that way, but you know. And she said in the notes, um, did the test on him, and he kept smiling with no obvious stimuli. You know, and, that, and that's what I felt the note was great, because there's something going on there. She knows why I'm stimulated, but um, yeah, so what's your view on taking nurses' notes? Well, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. The... Some of them were like, some of them were brilliantly dead now. Yeah. Some of them are... Well, yeah, you, you write things in behaviour terms rather than uh, an assumption about what to do. So you write what you, you, you always write what you can observe. So, so supposing someone is, um, they might be hearing voices and I can't. I wouldn't put, uh, looks like they're hearing voices, because that's just a subjective load of nonsense, isn't it? But I might say, their eyes were looking at something over my shoulder and he was mouthing responses to things I weren't saying. So it's like, you're right, in behaving terms. Um, talking about reading notes, I remember telling the third, which I think is one that, I mean, there's lots of fairly Kafkaesque, Kafkaesque elements in uh, mental health care, but one of them is that under the patient's charter, you do have the right to see your own medical notes and to review them. Um, however, and this is really quite beautiful, I think, if you're if your psychiatrist feels that there's something in your notes which might be detrimental to your mental health, i.e. Oh, something that pisses you off, uh, they can remove it and they don't have to tell you they've removed it. So it's really quite clever, I think. Maybe I've had yeah. something removed from my notes that I don't know about. Suicidal wanking. Yeah, suicidal wanking. Was it made easy? Did you feel that that... Um, because I work in healthcare myself, and my patients ask, usually it's because of a complaint, um, I want to see my notes, this is the worst hospital I've ever been to. Mm. Um, I don't really feel the pathways 
you give them a pound and you fill it with loaf and oh yeah, twice a pound off this. Mm. It's not really like that easy for them. I don't feel. Uh, well, I think I have. Fake, is it fake? I can't remember exactly. It wasn't that hard. It cost, oh, that's good. cost me 40 quid maybe, or 20 quid. Oh. Then. But there was like an absolute chunk of them, you know. Um, it's interesting, because I wasn't there to complain. Um, I was there to just to put back on the music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I work in a clinical setting, but it's often people want to, I can see their nose, but I don't think it's really that. Perhaps, I'll leave it. should give you like a little leaflet with the highlights of your best moments <laughs> in the early <ages. laughs> yeah. yeah. ah, Right. Uh, well, um, we, we've run out of time, I think. But thank you all so much for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Check out the exhibition and and we have two books downstairs. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'd also like to say that you are in conversation here each Saturday that we're open as well. So okay. you, you, you know, I didn't know that was ever, I, I just need to... Yeah. <laughs> You're not being so I'm here next to Philip Ross, who is yeah. on his yeah. leads in yeah. the yeah. And then there's a break. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. okay, and also, we planned a performance of my good prize at the um, clinical depression once I've found from the show. We don't know the time exactly, but it's planned for the 27th of July, which is when the exhibition finishes. Enough of plugging. Do you want to play anything more? Too late. Too late. Okay.